Introducing TurboGrafx-16, the next generation video game system. It's four times faster, so the games are more exciting. There are almost ten times as many colors, so the arcade quality graphics are even more intense. And you can expand your system with a CD player for CD games with sound effects that are turbocharged. The TurboGrafx-16 was not exactly a successful console in North America, despite having a pretty amazing library of games. Japan, however, was an entirely different story. The PC Engine's popularity in Japan was greater than even Nintendo's, at least for a short time. NEC Japan in the 1980s was a computer engineering and manufacturing giant. It's no surprise that they would be the first to develop a new console that would play games off a CD-ROM disc instead of a card, diskette, or cartridge. To put this in perspective, PC computers were just starting to release with CD-ROM drives in North America, and video game companies wouldn't start releasing games on CD-ROM as the norm until 1992. NEC's CD-ROM add-on was truly next-gen technology. Using the disc format of CD-ROM 2, the PC Engine CD add-on did very well in its home country, and some truly incredible games were released for it as the 1980s came to a close. If the TurboGrafx-16 was not up to the task of taking on Nintendo and Sega in North America, perhaps the release of a $400 add-on to the already failed system would even the odds. Well, that's exactly what NEC did in November of 1989, and believe it or not, it didn't even include a pack-in game. The story of NEC's endeavors to find success outside of Japan is not one of triumph and glory. It is a story of wasted opportunity and very bad choices. So join us as we take a look at the 20 Turbo CD-ROM 2 games that actually made it stateside between 1989 and 1993. Fighting Street Is a perfect port of a terrible game a perfect port or a terrible game? Fighting Street is actually quite the accomplishment. The graphics are near pixel perfect to the arcade, and despite the silly name change, you truly are getting Street Fighter on a home console. A feat even the big boys were still chasing. The music here is also on another level, taking full advantage of the CD-ROM space for sweet, uncompressed audio. At the end of the day, though, it's Street Fighter, and it plays only marginally better than Karate Champ. Don't forget to pick up a TurboTap and an extra controller if you want a friend to join in the fun because the TurboGrafx-16 only has one controller port. Monster Lair Monster Lair is apparently part of the Wonder Boy series, adding to one of the most amazingly confusing name conventions in gaming history. Like Fighting Street, Monster Lair is an almost perfect port of the arcade game it's based on. Two players fight their way through colorful auto-scrolling stages and fight huge cartoony bosses. Being an arcade port, the game can be finished very quickly and although fun, Monster Lair doesn't offer much in replayability. Easebook 1 and 2 Easebook 1 and 2 is my favorite JRPG of all time and one of my favorite games overall. Rather than talk about it, I'm just going to play this cutscene. to Dom Tower has been cut off. What should we do to stop this rogue? His bravery presents an interesting challenge. Let's see how far this Adol character can go before we crush him. Very well then, sir. Final Zone 2 Final Zone 2 is a top-down run-and-gun shooter with a similar style to Commando and Akari Warriors. 
Spectacular cutscene art and music set the stage for what is actually a very solid title. The game has great action and screen-filling boss encounters. The tunes are great, and the voice acting is just hilarious. Having a second player join in would have been phenomenal, but it's one player only for Final Zone 2. Last Alert Last Alert is another lonely one-player-only top-down shooter where you play as this absolute badass. I mean, look at this guy. The graphics and tunes are not bad, but the selection of weaponry is what sets this game apart. Which is to say, you get a flamethrower. Last Alert takes full advantage of the CD-ROM storage and loads this disc with a ton of cutscenes and animation. It's also a very long and difficult game that, in my opinion, would have been worth owning at the time. Magical Dinosaur Tour By this point, the Turbo CD's Japanese counterpart had been out for a few years, and had literally dozens of amazing games that could have been quickly localized and brought over to North America. But why do that when you can take a PC game that looks like something you'd be forced to play in Grade 9 Computer Lab and slap it on a disc instead? Magical Dinosaur Tour is pseudo-educational trash that has no place on any video game console, and I'm not wasting another word on it. Valus 2. Okay, now this is how it's done. Take a game with great side-scrolling action that's drenched in anime, something us kids were just kind of into at the time, and bring it stateside with a fully voiced English translation. Although not as smooth an experience as similar games, this side-scrolling action platformer was a gateway into the world of 80s anime, with its beautifully designed art and an almost unheard of amount of voice acting. The game itself is a bit clunky, and the difficulty is high, not because of careful game design, but because of the usual bullshit associated with action side-scrollers of the time. Get ready to get knocked off ledges by birds and bats over and over and over again. Valus 2 carries on what its hue card predecessor started, only this time with all the shine and glimmer the new CD-ROM format now afforded it. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Well, here we go again. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is another quick and dirty PC port. Only now with grainier graphics and much longer load times. Of all the games they could have chosen to release here, it truly boggles my mind to think that someone thought kids in North America would want to play this instead of this. I have made some this because I dare say I do believe this murderer is a much younger chap instead of this. It just makes no sense. What rubbish! What bald adam! J.B. Harold Murder Club. J.B. Harold Murder Club is what you would get if you took Konami's Snatcher and stripped away all of the style and coolness and replaced it with awkward, clunky, and poorly designed counterparts. Much like Snatcher, you wander around town, talking to people and gathering clues as you attempt to solve several murders. It's not a terrible game by any means, but it's just so incredibly dull compared to the game it shares space with on this system. Okay, how well can you snap your fingers? Alright, enough of that before I get a copyright strike. The Addams Family is a side-scrolling action-adventure game that is loosely based on the film, even though the only character from the film that is ever shown in the cutscenes is Tully Alford the family lawyer, played by veteran character actor Dan Hedaya. The game itself is pretty awful, and as I played it, I couldn't help but be reminded of another really bad game based on a movie. Run, jump, collect items as you dodge rats and birds and whatever this is. To be honest, this game makes Fester's quest on the NES feel like a masterpiece. Ease 3, Wanders, <clears throat> Ease 3, Wanderers from Ease. With the third Ease game, developer Nihon Falcom decided to try something different, and most fans of the series would wish they hadn't. Gone is the top-down bump-and-gride mechanics, and we are now presented with a more traditional side-scrolling role-playing game. The excellent art, 
Cutscenes, music are all still top-notch, and the story is as deep and engaging as ever. The main problem here, however, is that the game's levels aren't particularly well-designed and don't connect together as cohesively as the games that came before it. The game also suffers from very choppy scrolling, and the boss fights, now fought as a side-scroller, are uninspired and frustrating compared to East 2. The good news is that this misstep would eventually be corrected and then some, with later installments in the series returning to its top-down origin. It Came From the Desert It Came From the Desert is another port of a PC game, but this time they actually redesigned most of the game instead of just dumping the DOS version onto a CD-ROM. The game has some pretty basic side-scrolling levels where you battle giant ants in underground tunnels, collecting items and trying to stave off a giant insect apocalypse. There is a ton of full motion video in this game and it looks pretty bad by today's standards, but it's still very impressive when you look at the sheer scope of the production. It's also very ahead of its time, as in just a few years the full motion video gold rush of the mid-90s would be in full swing. Exile. Exile is an excellent action RPG that is both top-down and side-scrolling. Exile is a truly amazing game with a huge world to explore and a very involved story that will keep you playing for dozens of hours. Most of the game is spent in the top-down view and feels a lot like Fantasy Star 2, but switches to a Valis-style side-scroller for the fighting. From what I understand, translating a game of this scope into English is an involved and expensive endeavor. It isn't going to happen many more times on the Turbo CD, so you really have to appreciate a game like Exile when it comes along. Jack Nicholas Turbo Golf. Welcome to Castle Pines Golf Club, located in Castle Rock, Colorado. Every game system needs a golf game, and the Turbo CD gets a pretty okay one with Jack Nicholas Turbo Golf. Golf games without Nintendo characters aren't really my thing, but this game seems to have everything that a golf game fan could want in the early 90s. Ball is in. Parking lot. Valis 3. I wish I could say that Valis 3 improves on its predecessor in every way, but it's actually just more of the same, which isn't too bad, I guess. I always loved how in the opening, you dive off a skyscraper and freefall towards your sword in a do-or-die moment before you transform into Wonder Woman and kick everybody's ass. More than just a Lady Castlevania, Valis 3 allows you to switch between several characters and use a number of magical items to help you in your quest to destroy the incredibly overdressed rogues gallery of bosses. Unfortunately, the same things that made the first game annoying are all here in spades, so get ready to die a lot. Cosmic Fantasy 2 Cosmic Fantasy 2 is another top-down RPG, only this time the battles are turn-based. In the game, you will explore the world, find a new town, explore the nearby dungeons, and rinse and repeat. The game is by no means terrible, but it feels very undercooked in pretty much all aspects, especially the battles. You just wail on one another like mindless robots until someone drops. There is no finesse or depth at all. The story is fun at times, but Cosmic Fantasy 2 comes up really short compared to other games from the time in this genre. Lords of the Rising Sun Lords of the Rising Sun is a war strategy game with action elements. Ported from the Amiga for the Turbo CD, think Defender of the Crown, except Feudal Japan instead of Medieval Times Dinner and Tournament. I am woefully unqualified to speak about games in this genre, but it certainly looks like the real deal. Splash Lake Finally, a puzzle game! Splash Lake is a one-screen-at-a-time puzzle game where you take control of an ostrich and use your beak to smash tiles as you try to avoid enemies. Knock all of the enemies into the water and you move on to the next stage. Splash Lake is an excellent puzzle game, albeit not quite as good as, say, Kickle Cubicle, and I think it's fair to mention that the game's difficulty ramps up to insane levels as you get into the higher stages, of which there are 60 in total. Vastille Vastille is an action-strategy space war game. 
It features very subpar artwork and dubious voice acting. Stefan, your first campaign is about to begin. Yes. Now that I've started this, I must win this war at any cost. You move your forces around a hexagonal grid and do battle on a more zoomed-in overhead view. Although I admit this genre is not for me, I feel that even its biggest proponents would balk at this game. The music also sounds like it's from an old body break video. Buster Bros. Buster Bros is the last CD-ROM 2 game to be released in North America. And if you made it this far in the video, I don't need to explain the game to you. Buster Bros, also known as Pang in some regions, is a very authentic port of the arcade game it is based on, and another much needed two-player game for the Turbo CD. The Turbo CD's North American Invasion was a complete and total failure for NEC. The system add-on and its games fell short of making a splash in an environment that was now being dominated by the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, both of which were at this point locked in a brutal console war that would eclipse everything around them. If you include the Turbo Express handheld that NEC hoped would topple the Game Boy, the Turbo CD marks three very expensive defeats at making their mark in North America for the company. Surely NEC would pick up the pieces and head back to the land of the rising sun and just give up on North America. But as it turns out, NEC had already developed a new CD-ROM format and had engineered a completely new system to play them on. In May 1993, NEC would launch one final do-or-die assault on the shores of North America. For them, it would be victory or death.